is my screen. There we go. Okay, good morning. Um, welcome to today's presentation, Chemical Reactions Part A, ILM 3, 301, 301, 303DA. Uh, let's see what we've got looking at today. Rationale for today, uh, looking at chemical reactions. Many places we work at as instrument techs rely on chemical reactions to produce some type of a product for market. Thus, understanding different types of reactions will help you as a tradesperson understand how these plants will operate. Uh, in this module, we're going to learn about five different categories of chemical reactions, uh, how to identify them, how to balance them, and then how we can also control the speed of a reaction. So uh, reaction basics kind of is what this ILM is uh, giving us. So the five objectives today are describe classifications of chemical reactions. So we'll look at five uh, different types of reactions uh, and we'll be able to identify them after that. Um, we'll describe the chemical reactions involving a metal and a metal ion, which is, uh, we've been doing this already, so it shouldn't be too bad. Describe the factors that influence the rate of a chemical reaction. So we'll look at the dynamics of some reactions and things that we can do uh, to speed them up and or slow them down. Uh, objective four, describe exothermic and endothermic reactions. So this is pretty simply uh, defining two different types of uh, reactions. Uh, nothing too heavy here. And associated with endothermic and exothermic is describing the activation energy and reaction rate uh, of reactions. And we can see all of the information we need for objectives four and five off of a uh, reaction rate graph that we'll be looking at uh, towards the end of the ILM. So let's see what we get next here. Okay, so as we stated earlier, uh, a long time ago actually, matter is neither created nor destroyed in a reaction, it only changes form. And we are going to be looking at five different types of reactions uh, in this ILM. They are composition, decomposition, which is the opposite of composition, single replacement, which is exactly as it sounds, double replacement, also same as it sounds, and combustion, which we looked at uh, already here. And we'll just look at the individual characteristics of these types of reactions so that you'll understand how they work and be able to identify them when you're looking at a chemical formula. So getting right into it here, we have combination reaction first off. In a combination reaction, two or more substances combine to form a new substance. So pretty straightforward. We talk about combination and we're combining two or more elements or substances into something new. So the uh, general model for the formula uh, that we'll be using for all of these different types of reactions looks like, uh, looks like we have here. In this case, it's A plus Z react and create a new product, which is AZ, it combines them. So in this case, for an example, we have chlorine gas plus sodium, and we combine them in a reaction, and that provides us with sodium chloride, which we know as common table salt. So this is com combining chlorine with sodium and getting a new product. So A plus Z equals AZ. So, um, Again, this is a gas, this is a solid, the product ends up becoming a solid. And as we look uh, forward through some of these reactions that we're gonna be looking at, you'll see that we can have uh, a couple of liquids that make a solid or liquid and a gas that make a solid and things like that. Uh, these are just some of the characteristics that are associated with particular uh, reactions. So this combination reaction, the simplest of all of them, uh, two different substances get combined into something else. These are sometimes called composition uh, reactions or synthesis reactions. Here we have a decomposition reaction. Not much to say on this one. It is quite simply the opposite of the previous reaction where we have uh, two uh, substances that are combined that when uh, reacted break out into two individual substances. So in this case here we have calcium carbonate that decomposes into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. So again, AZ breaks down into A plus 
Z. Third, moving right along here, is called a single replacement reaction. And this is only slightly more complicated than the previous two examples here. And this leads us into uh, these reactions uh, between a metal and a metal ion, as we mentioned in the objectives here. Uh, and in this case here, you'll usually have uh, a metal ion sitting here by itself, um, a metal ion, cation, I guess I should be more specific, a cation here and a cation here, and this is your anion. And when you combine them, A plus BZ, the resulting product, simply single replacement means that A replaces B. So in this case, the product is going to be AZ plus B. So we've replaced A with B in our product. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, looking at it in terms of a, an actual formula here, we have iron as a cation sitting here, and then we have copper sulfate. Copper is the cation, sulfate is the anion. When we do our single replacement, all we're going to be doing is switching the cations, in this case, the iron with the copper in the product. So you see over here in the product, we now have FeSO4 plus the copper ion by itself, and that is a single replacement reaction and there is not much left to say about that. The next one, uh, double replacement, is uh, probably the most complicated one and it's not complicated at all. Double replacement, as the name would apply, uh, occurs when two ionic compounds exchange cations, not different than the previous single replacement, except in this case we have um, two uh, substances here basically and two substances here basically and they are again they're just being replaced so A replaces B in both of these situations here so we go from AX to AZ and we go from BZ to BX they just simply switch and it doesn't matter necessarily which to switch because you get the same results but the general idea is they switch cations. Um, in order for this to be defined as a double replacement reaction, there is one specific criteria, and that is one of the two products formed must be insoluble, meaning that it does not dissolve. This is demonstrated in the reaction uh, as a precipitate uh, that drops out of the solution. So we'll look at what a precipitate is. Basically, uh, it's a, a solid that is formed in a reaction that is not dissolved in the reaction and it's just sitting on the bottom uh, of your beaker and we'll look at that uh, in the next slide here a little bit more to see what that looks like. So here we have a combination of silver nitrate, AgNO3, being combined with hydrochloric acid solution. Uh, so you'll notice here both of these are liquids. We have a liquid here and a liquid here. We mix them together and we end up with something on the bottom. Uh, a solid silver chloride precipitate. So from the two liquids that we added, we got a reaction which caused uh, the silver chloride to drop out of the mixture. And one of the results, as you'll see in the formula here, is the solid. And this has to be in there in order for it to be called a double replacement reaction. Uh, all of the examples that we look at, I believe, are this way, there is no way uh, that we're really uh, necessarily trying to trick you uh, in this uh, for the most part. For the most part, uh, I'll, I'll uh, preempt that last comment with the next slide, uh, which mentions uh, some, uh, something briefly mentioned in the ILM, and I'm not 100% sure, I think it's still in the ILM, uh, something called a neutralization reaction, and we've dabbled in this a little bit uh, when we started talking about pH uh, and the pH chemistry with the concentration of hydroniums and the concentrations of hydroxides. Um, and when we're in the lab trying to uh, simulate neutralization, uh, this is the, the reaction that happens between an acid and a base. We combine them and the result is salt and, a wa uh, and water. Um, and this is a specific type of double replacement uh, type of reaction uh, again. So this is neutralization. So anytime you see an acid being combined with the base, that's the indicator uh, for a neutralization type of reaction.
reaction. So those are the five uh, reactions uh, that we are looking at in terms of the objectives in the ILM. Uh, not a lot of detail in there, uh, aside from being able to recognize their form and being able to define them based on their form. So that leads us to a little exercise. Uh, I was trying to think of a nice way to do this exercise uh, during this presentation, but I haven't mastered that technology yet. Um, but the drill here basically is for you to complete and balance. Uh, I've just kind of skipped a few steps and, and went straight to what the answers are here. Um, but in this case here, all we're doing is we are um, determining what type of reaction it is and basically swapping our cations. So you'll see we start out here with uh, PBNO3, which is lead nitrate and hydrochloric acid. We pour these into a container. Uh, we switch the A and the B, the P and the H here around. We're going to end up with PBCL and HNO3, which is what we've got over here. And then from uh, the point where we, we uh, transfer our cations around, we then have to go into uh, balancing. So uh, just to review our balancing here, making sure that we have the same number of all the elements on the left-hand side of the equation as we have on the right-hand side of the equation, and adding some coefficients in here in order to make them balance. So just looking quickly here, we have one lead, one lead, two nitrates here, two nitrates here, two hydrogens here, two hydrogens here, two chlorines here, and two chlorines here. So this is all nicely, finely balanced. Uh, I'm not going to go through the remaining uh, examples here. They are exactly the same as a previous example. Again, um, switching uh, A for B and then, and then balancing here. Um, the next little step that we're going to go to, uh, you'll notice that all of these are double uh, double replacement reactions. That's because they are the, probably one of the more common ones, or at least the more common ones that we look at here in this uh, in this ILM. Uh, so let's move forward and see why we're why we're focusing on this. So this slide talks about solubility rules. Uh, we said that if we mix uh, two two things together uh, that are in the form of a double replacement type reaction, uh, we should end up with some type of a precipitate. Uh, if we don't get a precipitate, we don't really call it a double replacement reaction anymore. So this little table is something that we use to determine if the substances in our chemical formulas will react to, perform, uh, to produce a precipitate or not a precipitate. Um, it's, it looks a little more complicated than it is. It's really uh, not too bad. And I do uh, admittedly have a tendency to mess this up. Uh, during my lectures usually, um, but it's not as hard uh, as I may make it be. Uh, three simple rules. First, we're going to identify the ions in the product compound, and that's probably the key part right there is in the product compound. Then we're going to check the ions column, this, uh, this column right here, to see if any of these ions that we've previously identified in the product uh, are there, and if they are listed, then we're going to check these columns to see whether they are soluble or insoluble. So uh, the next slide gives us a couple examples of uh, what exactly all this uh, hullabaloo is all about. Okay, so how do we determine solubility here? We have sodium nitrate in a solution combined with hydrochloric acid in a solution, and we have a reaction that creates um, <clears throat> This is nitric acid and salt. So we have to look for ions that are here. So it's not as easy when we don't have um, both of the tables and, and things on the screen, but let's just see what happens. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, HNO3 first, and we'll go back to this slide. So we've identified H as one of our elements in our product. So H is in there, and we see it is soluble with all compounds. So if I look at it and I go, well, how do I know if it's soluble with NO3? Well, the rule says H is soluble with absolutely everything. So this is why I have S for soluble. Okay. 
Next, we're going to look at sodium chloride. So identified uh, sodium. We don't see sodium sitting here easily identifiable, but we, uh, we do know that sodium is in group 1A. So group 1A is soluble in all compounds. So again, soluble. So if this is soluble and this is soluble, I am not going to have any type of precipitate. There's going to be no solid produced because both of these uh, compounds are completely soluble. Okay, I hope that's that's the best I've done on my first example uh, describing them before. So again, uh, looking at just one more here uh, so we get the right general idea. So calcium nitrate combined with uh, sodium sulfate yields calcium sulfate and sodium nitrate. So again, we'll use the table looking for ions that we've identified in the products. Calcium sulfate to start. Uh, we look over here and, uh, oh, there's SO4. So I see SO4 is here and it says soluble with most compounds except for calcium. Ah, okay, so not soluble. Capiche? I hope so. Next, we're going to look at sodium uh, nitrate. So again, sodium again we know uh, was in group 1A. Uh, coincidentally, nitrate is also in here, but we'll just start up with sodium. We usually only have to do one. Sodium is soluble with all compounds and insoluble with none. So I believe we're going to say that this is soluble. Yes, I did. So this is not soluble and this is soluble. This means that this is going to drop out as some type of a precipitate. So uh, do we get a precipitate? Yes, we do. Okay, one more, I guess I'm collecting for punishment. Uh, potassium iodide plus copper sulfate yields potassium sulfate plus copper iodine. So starting out looking at KSO4, we have SO4 in here and it says it is soluble with most compounds except for silver, lead, calcium, barium, and strontium, which we are not dealing with. So we are gonna say that it is soluble. Next, we have copper iodine. So again, we're looking for copper here. Don't see it anywhere, but I do see iodide. Here's iodine, and it is soluble with most compounds. Oops, most compounds, except not copper. So insoluble, N. This is soluble, this is not soluble. Therefore, we are going to have a participant not a participate, a uh, precipitate. Uh, so yes, for precipitate. So I hope that's adequate to get you through. Uh, I'll let you do the last one yourself there. Okay, next up here we have combustion reactions. And we have touched on combustion reactions in a couple of other uh, areas. Uh, analyzers, we looked at it. Measurement, we looked at it a little bit. Earlier in chemistry, we looked at it. Um, just to re review this a little bit, combustion reaction occurs when a fuel burns. Heat is created. For us, specifically in third year, we talk about hydrocarbon combustion. Uh, we, in the next section we're talking in ILMs, after we're done uh, chemical reactions part B, is all based on organic chemistry, which is based on hydrocarbons for our purposes. Uh, and hydrocarbons have the general formula C, X, H, Y. So a certain number of carbons and a certain number of hydrogens, hence the name hydrocarbons. Um, when we have uh, hydrocarbon combustion reactions uh, and they're done properly, uh, they always create heat, water, and carbon dioxide as their products. We learn that there's lots of times when we don't have it right and we get things like uh, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrates of oxides, and different bad things. But when it's done right, uh, combustion provides heat, water, and carbon dioxide as products. Okay, here's a couple of examples here. Um, the only reason I, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> threw this slide in here um, is because it shows this one particular reaction here between magnesium uh, and oxygen. Um, this is also a combustion 
um, the combustion equation, but it's not something that we generally focus on uh, in third year. As I said earlier, it's mostly uh, based on hydrocarbons. Um, those of you who are campers or Boy Scouts or, or anything like that um, may have at some point in time seen these fire starters that you can buy at the, at the hardware store or the sporting goods store and they're a little block uh, of magnesium and you take your knife and you file off um, little shards of magnesium into a, into a pile and then there's a striker on the black back of this thing and you strike it with your pocket knife and uh, the spark lands on this magnesium and it ignites into a really bright uh, hot flame. So uh, just, I don't know, I guess that's a Cliff Clavin kind of thing. I don't know why I necessarily mentioned it, but that is also a, a combustion type reaction. But again, back to what is more important here is uh, hydrocarbons. Again, CXHY plus oxygen gives us water, carbon dioxide, and generally heat. So here's uh, CH4, uh, which is methane. And here's C5H12, which is pentane, both reacting with oxygen to give us uh, water and carbon dioxide. And then, of course, we have to uh, write a balanced equation uh, accounting for the number of carbons and hydrogens and, and that kind of thing. But we'll be doing that uh, really quick here, so I'm not going to do it on this slide. Okay, so next page on 12, page 1213 12, here uh, asks us to uh, prove that we can write unbalanced and balanced formulas for combustion. So again, combustion pretty straightforward. Some type of a hydrocarbon fuel plus oxygen is going to give us CO2 plus H2O. The only thing missing here is a bunch of uh, coefficients in order to be able to balance everything out. I'm not going to go through the drill uh, specifically uh, with all of these ones, but uh, just to review again, two carbons over here, so I'm going to probably put a two carbon over here. That's going to give me four oxygens over here, and then another oxygen is five, and then we run into that problem with odd number of oxygens, so then you're going to change this to a four, which is going to make, you know, all that kind of wonderful stuff. So I'm not going to get into that too deeply with you guys, but this is the unbalanced version of the formula, and then by adding those coefficients in there, you'll get your balanced formula. Okay, so looking now at metals and metal ions uh, specifically here, and this looks uh, at a uh, single replacement reaction in this case, uh, again, modeled by A plus BZ equals AZ plus B, where we just switch A and B or replace A with B. Same, same thing we, uh, we looked at in the previous slide here. So again, a switches with B. So products over here, A has taken the place of B, and B has taken the place of A. These are the uh, cations, again, doing this switcheroo. Okay, uh, I guess what's specific about this, I guess, is we need to know, because uh, the next slide is going to ask us, how do we know if I put iron and copper sulfate that I'm going to get uh, a reaction out of it all. Not everything reacts with everything else. We don't we don't know that. That's part of chemistry. That's why we kind of study it. Um, so when we're looking at these single replacement reactions and we want to find out whether or not uh, this is even possible, there's a fancy table. So hang on. This is another little fun exercise coming up here. Uh, we call uh, this table that we use to determine if a spontaneous reaction will occur between two metallic elements, the electromotive series. Uh, just remember that term as the electromotive series. It looks like this. Uh, this is from the ILM. You'll notice we've got a list of elements here, uh, and we have an arrow at the top here. Okay, so we're going to be doing something with this in order to determine whether or not a spontaneous reaction will occur in a single replacement uh, reaction. So a single replacement uh, will have a spontaneous reaction when metal A is before metal B in the series. So if we look at our example here, iron plus copper sulfate, metal A, does it occur before metal B? So we start over here and we start trucking, boom, boom, boom. And we're looking for either iron or copper. So boom, 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 boom. Oh, here's iron. 
and then boom, 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 boom. Here's copper. So iron occurs before copper. We're following this error, uh, arrow, following the arrow. So iron occurs before copper. Therefore, we have a spontaneous reaction. If I had a different example, in this case, you'll see copper plus iron sulfate. We go look for copper. Do, 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 do. We already know copper is way over here. It happens after iron. So therefore, there will be no reaction. So that's how you use um, the electromotive series table. It's not very tricky. Um, metal A occurs before metal B. Yes, there will be a reaction. And if it occurs, does not occur before B, then no, there will be no reaction. Uh, we use this similar exercise when we're dealing with uh, hydrogen and specifically water reactions. This ties into our analyzers where we talk about um, lots of liquid analyzers this year. Uh, hydrogen is particularly important because if we know if the metal is on the left or right, we can determine if the metal will dissolve in acid, which releases hydrogen gas. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about some things that are also indicators uh, that a reaction is occurring and the releasing of a gas in the form of bubbles is a fantastic indicator that a reaction is happening uh, visually. Um, but to the point of this rule here, uh, you'll see this looks very, very, very similar to the electromotive series uh, chart because it is. Uh, still have the arrow on the top. These are all exactly the same. And basically we're doing the same thing here. Metals to the left of hydrogen in the electromotive series will react spontaneously with water. Metals to the right of hydrogen in the electromotive series will not react spontaneously with water. Um, I guess normally if we were in class, I'd probably uh, maybe take a little break and say, hey, go on the interweb there and have a look for a video uh, that shows somebody throwing pure sodium uh, into a lake or a pond or a swimming pool or a fish tank. And you'll see you get quite an incredible reaction uh, between pure sodium uh, and water. Uh, explosive, fiery reaction. That's pretty cool. But at any rate, any of these uh, on the left-hand side of hydrogen, when you throw them into water, are going to react in some way or form. Uh, whereas the items on the right-hand side of hydrogen, copper, mercury, silver, and gold, uh, you may have learned through life experiences that these are generally concerned considered to be more inert or less reactive. Uh, silver and gold, we kind of we kind of know are far less uh, reactive. Copper and mercury uh, kind of fall in that same category here as well. So again, simple to operate, same way we did uh, with the metal and metal ion uh, comparison with this electromotive series. So this leads us now into uh, reaction reaction rates on page 19. So how do reactions happen. Uh, usually I get into a, a long uh, drawn out explanation about reaction rates and I relate it to going to the going to the club on a Friday night uh, and describing a chemical reaction the same way we had described trying to find a, a date at the, at the club. Um, so lots of things have to ha have to happen in chemistry in order to get a reaction to occur just as well. There's lots of things that happen uh, that have to happen at a nightclub in order for you to find the love of your life, or if not Mrs. Wright, or Mr. Wright, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Wright now. Um, some of the things that uh, we're going to talk about here in chemistry are, are very similar to that kind of a relationship uh, in life. And we'll I'll kind of throw things in here a little bit as, as we go along. So first, first off here, uh, chemists have developed a theory to explain reaction rates based on the collisions that occur between reactant molecules. Uh, they say that there are three possible interactions that are, occur illustrated in these diagrams. The first is that there is no collision, therefore there is no reaction. And this is the equivalent of going to uh, Billy Bob's at five o'clock in the afternoon and expecting to find love. Uh, probably not gonna happen. You're gonna be sitting at the bar by yourself talking to the bartender. Uh, you're not gonna bump into Mr. and Mrs. Wright because they're they're probably not there, and if they are there, they're probably avoiding you because you're some creepy guy at the bar at five o'clock. Uh, the second scenario here, uh, we have low energy collisions. 
that are a result of improper orientation, uh, which also result in no type of reaction. So this is like seven, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Uh, some of your friends have come along and now you're drinking at a table and then there's another table of uh, the, the opposite uh, party uh, having a good time over there. But you're, you know, you're sitting around shooting the breeze with your friends and they're sitting around shooting the breeze with your friends and you both get up to go pee at the same time and you kind of walk by each other but none of you are really happy enough to get the courage to introduce yourselves. So you, you, you know they're there but you don't really have a reaction. Last one here, uh, diagram C. Uh, this happens, you know, 11, 11 to 2 a.m. Uh, you've had some catalysts uh you're feeling kind of loose the place is really full and you can't move around with bumping into somebody and bang you turn around uh, at the bar and you run square head on into the, the person of your dreams and love is in the air and you have uh you have a reaction so same kind of idea in chemistry you can you can be there but you may not meet you can be there and you might not have enough energy or uh what do they call that uh you have I'm missing out on chemistry. Again, like, how do you like that? You don't have the chemistry, so you don't make eye contact. You don't form a relationship. There's no reaction. And then finally, towards the end, the chemistry is there and you're ready to have a reaction. So uh, first of all, it has to do with, you have to be able to interact in order to have a reaction first. Okay, we can tell if a reaction has occurred, uh, usually by some form of, uh, some form of a visual reference. Um, some of the common ones are a color change in the products. Uh, we mentioned earlier a precipitate being formed is another good example of a reaction happening. Uh, we also mentioned earlier that a gas is released. If you see gas or bubbles, uh, when you mix a couple things together, you know there's some kind of a reaction happening going on. Uh, and then lastly here, this fourth one, um, there may be heating and or cooling uh, as a result of the chemical reaction. Of course, a lot harder to see. Um, but if it was fire, for example, you would certainly be able to feel it. Um, if you ever twisted your ankle or something like that, and you went to the school nurse and they gave you one of those little ice packs and you had to snap, uh, you had to snap the cartridge inside the ice pack and then suddenly it got cold. Well, that's a reaction that has occurred uh, that has a cooling effect. So not all indicators that a reaction has occurred. So we mentioned um, we mentioned um, reactions and the collisions that are required in order for reactions to happen or the interaction uh, between the different substances. We uh, also have sometimes when the rate of, the rate of this reaction is important. Um, you know, you might not have the time to go to the club at five o'clock in the afternoon and sit there till two o'clock. Uh, you know, to, to find love. So there's things that you can do, obviously. Um, some of them are savory and some of them are unsavory, but let's look at the chemistry ones here and I'll make some kind of uh, semi-inappropriate uh, relationships between uh, these five things that we can do in order to uh, help uh, expedite a chemical reaction uh, and we'll kind of relate them to our experience uh, of our night out. So reaction rates can be varied by uh, four, if you read in the ILM, and then they list five actual factors. So the first one is nature of the reactants. So uh, if we're in the club, what mood are you in? Uh, you know, uh, it's five o'clock, you're after work, you're either just unwind or are you looking for love? That plays an impact on it. Uh, if the nature of the reactants aren't compatible, they're not going to react. Uh, second one is the concentration of reactants. So same kind of thing, if there's just you and one other person in the club, uh, chances are, unless things are perfect, you're, you're not going to have uh, any type of reaction. Love's not going to be in the air, but as the day, uh, as the evening goes on, the club fills up more and more and more, more and more people, more and more concentration, higher odds of you running into somebody and having a reaction. Number three, uh, temperature, uh, generally, as a general rule, is as things warm up, uh, they move more. As they move more, they tend to collide more, uh, and that helps to facilitate reactions as well. Uh, this is similar in the club. 
uh, not much going on, 5, 6, 7, 8 o'clock, but 9, 10, 11 o'clock when you're out dancing, uh, things are getting warm, things are heating up, you're bumping into people, there are opportunities abound. Uh, number four, catalyst. Uh, something that we can introduce into a reaction that doesn't participate in the reaction, uh, but does facilitate the reaction. Uh, we'll make this simple and we'll say that tequila is a good catalyst. Uh, there are other catalysts, of course, out there, um, but it is something that we can introduce in order to try to help our cause. Now, we'll go with tequila because that's, of course, uh, legal. Last but not least, uh, surface area, giving uh, an area for a reaction to occur. So let's throw a dance floor uh, into the mix here. You throw in a dance floor, uh, you're gonna get lots of heat, you're gonna get lots of collision, there's probably gonna be lots of catalysts in there. The, the nature of the reactants are probably pretty liberal and pretty free-spirited. So uh, with that surface area, we can also facilitate uh, a reaction uh, as well and, and get things going a little faster. So we'll look at these um, in a little bit more detail, but I think you probably have a general idea of what the uh, overall effect of these factors are on, react, uh, on reaction rates. So here we look at bonds and breaking of, of bonds. Of course, in order for something new to be formed, the original bonds need to be broken. Um, and the way that uh, they break, it's, it's a little more chemistry than we get into in this course, but a long story short here is the orientation of, uh, orientation of things has to be proper in order for A, the bond to break, and for a new bond to be formed. Um, some bonds will break more easily uh, and some, uh, some not. So if, if they break easily, they'll, they'll uh, form a reaction a lot faster, and if they, they don't, it'll take a little bit longer for that to occur. So think of an explosion, a uh, very, very fast reaction uh, versus, versus the formation of a diamond, for example, which takes many, 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 many years. So bond bonding and breaking those bonds and remaking those bonds, uh, pretty important little spelling mistake down here. Okay, so we mentioned a few slides ago uh, the collisions that have to occur before a reaction takes place. In a low concentration environment, of course, productive collisions will be rare and the reaction will be very slow. It'll take some time for that to happen. In high concentrations, the productive collisions happen more frequently and that as thus the reactions will happen much faster. Uh, proper orientation odds simply increase with concentration, right? We're looking for everything to line up just right. You gotta meet, you gotta meet eyes across a crowded room. Uh, you gotta wait till you've, uh, you know, sat in a different spot at your table so you can make eye contact with A who's hiding way back here, that kind of idea. Okay, so that's concentration of reactions. Okay, temperature of reactants here. Increasing the temperature does two things. Uh, first, it makes the molecules move faster and collide more. Uh, in human terms, this is like summer versus winter. Uh, in winter, we tend to uh, hole up in our houses and not go out very much. And in the summertime, we all like to get out and go exploring. So thus, it's more um, conducive to uh, meeting people and having reactions when things are warm than it is when things are cold. If we insert humans for molecules, that makes it pretty easy to remember. So therefore, as temperature increases, so does the speed of a reaction. <coughs> last, second last here, uh, catalyst. Excuse me. A catalyst is something that speeds up a reaction. Uh, as I said earlier, it takes part in the reaction, but it does not react in it. Uh, a common example of a catalyst is a catalytic converter in your vehicle. Uh, which is filled with platinum or some other noble metal, and it allows the gases to react at a lower temperature uh, in order to reduce emissions. So it doesn't, it's not a part of the product or the reactants, it's just there to facilitate the, the reaction. Uh, catalysts can be positive or negative, meaning that they can make the reaction faster or slower. Usually we're interested in making them faster, um, but there are times when we may be interested in making them slower. 
last variable, I believe, uh, affecting reaction rates here is surface area. Uh, we talked about surface area earlier as well. Contact uh, increases reaction rates. More surface area leads to more interactions and therefore more contact. So I stole this little picture off the internet here and, and um, basically uh, what's happening here is if we were to drop this Alka-Seltzer pill into a glass of water, uh, it would take, let's give it an arbitrary number of three minutes to completely dissolve. Uh, if we broke it in half, each half of this Alka-Seltzer would probably dissolve uh, a little bit faster. We could probably get rid of both of these pieces in two minutes. If we broke it into four, they might all four dissolve in one minute. And if we ground it up into a powder, all the powder could dissolve in 30 seconds, for example. So giving it more surface area, more interaction between, uh, in this case, the seltzer and the water, we're facilitating that reaction by providing more surface area. I could spread this powder uh, out into a big square that looks like this versus the small circle uh, that the pill represents. So that's how surface area can affect reaction rates. Now we move on to the one of this is another objective, I believe, coming up here talking about endothermic and exothermic reactions. This is on page 24. Uh, this is uh, not something that you maybe find relatable to our trade necessarily, but good. Uh, good background information in terms of some of the processes that you may encounter working in the field. Um, and this endothermic and exothermic uh, has to do with two ways uh, that a reaction uh, that a reaction can go down. So the bonds that connect molecules store energy, right? They're they're holding on to each other. We learned earlier that some of these bonds are easier to break. Some of them are harder to break. That's related to the amount of energy that is wrapped up inside that bond. Well, we don't get into the super dirty details of these bonds and how strong they are. Uh, it's above our pay grade, but just kind of understand that there is there is some physics. Uh, chemistry slash physics behind uh, the strength of these bonds and the energy uh, that is required to break them uh, and the relationship with uh, the amount of energy and, and whether it's an endothermic or an exothermic reaction. And that's kind of what we're discussing in this next section here. Okay, so first and foremost, I'm trying to make the presentation kind of simplify the majority of the content in the ILM here. Uh, so I put the general idea all on one slide. Uh, I only have one slide for each of these reactions. Uh, it kind of gives you the low down dirty general idea uh, of what we're looking at in terms of, of these, these types of reactions. So first off is uh, endothermic. If you knew Latin, uh, endo means in, kind of means internal, exo means kind of external. Um, I don't know if that helps you with anything, but just a little background there, I guess Cliff, Cliff Clavin and me coming out. Okay, so an endothermic reaction requires energy for the reaction to happen, and the product has more energy than the reactants. This is really the, the major uh, signifier between an endothermic and an exothermic reaction is the amount of energy that the reactants end up having. And we'll see we have a scale here with energy on the y-axis here and time on the x-axis here. We have our reactants uh, on this side, we have this variable here, Ea, which called, is called activation energy. So in a combustion uh, reaction, for example, this activation energy would be the match that we applied to the fuel. Uh, in this case, there's, it's above my pay grade, it's above your pay grade to really know what it is. But do know that most reactions require some form of activation, uh, activation energy. Don't get too hung up on it at this point anyway. We'll talk about this again uh, in a couple slides. So we have our reactants here. We mix them together. Uh, energy builds as this reaction happens. And the, and the reaction is, is occurring. And once all the products are joined together, we end up with some type of a product. The product here, in this case, this line, we went over the scale here, this line is more than this line. So 
we have more energy in our re in our products than we had in our reactants and you'll see the opposite of this happening uh, in an endo I'm sorry in an exothermic reaction so knowing this graph take the words off of it for example take this away from here and I showed you this picture I would expect you to be able to determine whether or not it's an endo or an exothermic reaction based off this type of a picture Here's a common example of an endothermic reaction. Uh, this is dissolving ammonium nitrate in water. This is that chemistry behind the cold packs. Um, we have ammonium nitrate and water. We, com uh, we combine them with some form of energy. This is that activation energy and our resulting product is ammonium nitrate. Just a common example. Here's exothermic reaction. Uh, this does not uh, require as much energy. I shouldn't say doesn't require energy, but does not require as much energy. And that resulting product has less energy than the reactants. And that's how we know that it's exothermic. Uh, therefore, the product is usually a higher temperature. Okay, so it does not require energy, thus it has a uh, higher temperature. So here again, we have our energy line, our timeline here, we have our reactants, our activation energy. The reaction occurs and our final product has less energy down here than we had up here. So common examples of exothermic reaction, any combustion type of reaction here. And you'll notice that the energy is on this side of the formula versus on the left hand side of the formula. So another way to distinguish between uh, endothermic reaction with the energy on the reactant side and an exothermic with the energy on the reactant side. Okay, a uh, quick little, this is kind of the combination graph here. So if your energy after the reaction is higher, it's endothermic. And if your energy after the reaction is lower, it is an exothermic. Okay, gas won't burn by itself. Um, we learned that earlier, we have to light it usually. Uh, this energy we introduce as fire is known as the activation energy or EA uh, and it is the initial energy we need to get the party started. We don't talk anymore about it uh, in terms of what type of energy is it that we need to start this reaction. Don't worry about it. It's not that important. Uh, just know that it does uh, generally take some energy to get things going whether that's inherent energy within the compounds themselves or whether it's something like a match. Uh, or fire that we have to introduce, something has to happen. That's all you need to know about uh, that necessarily. Um, so this is activation energy, as I said earlier, this EA portion here. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, this activation energy uh, in the next couple of slides here, uh, related to catalysts. And this will take us, um, this is the final stretch of this particular presentation. So the speed of a reaction is shown below in a multi-layered uh, graph here that's going to illustrate uh, that it is faster with a catalyst than without it. And as a review here, catalysts provide a place for the molecules to hang out and do their thing or interact or collide, or collide rather than just bouncing around. Uh, we use that catalyst to speed things up. And it also has the characteristic of reducing the amount of acti activation energy required. So for example, we're at the nightclub and you're two sheets to the wind and your love interest is also two sheets to the wind. Thank thanks to our friendly catalyst tequila, uh, it's going to take a lot less actual work on your behalf to find love, right? More tequila equals less work. Um, so here we have uh, graph <clears throat> C showing a positive, uh, positive catalyst and you'll see that our EA, if we were to draw lines horizontally across C, B and A, you'll see that a normal reaction illustrated by this curve B without a catalyst, uh, a moderate amount of energy and a, it's, this isn't a great graph in my opinion but starts here and ends somewhere kind of here in the middle. So it takes, you know, X amount of time without a catalyst. If I want to speed things up, I will add a positive catalyst. The resulting uh, action by adding the positive catalyst does two things. 
first, it reduces the overall activation energy required. You'll see by the size in our peak between B and A, this is less activation energy than B if we were to draw across there. And uh, it also shows less time, assuming that they started both at the same time. With the catalyst, it shows less time on the time scale. Uh, and then line A at the top here is a negative catalyst uh, intended to slow things down. Um, requires much more activation energy measured on the energy scale. And if we looked at time, terrible representation. Time should be a little bit further over here if I was drawing this graph. Uh, I don't know if they maybe mix that up, but should have longer time uh, with the negative catalyst as well. So that's the wrap up, I guess, for the first uh, ILM chemical reactions part A. Finito. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.